things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So we pick up our chronological study of the Gospels this morning by looking at Luke chapter number 10. If you have your Bibles, before you turn to Luke 10, why don't you go ahead and turn to Luke 1. I'm just going to give, it's been a little while since we've been in the Gospel of Luke, so I want to give us a little bit of a refresher as to why he is writing this Gospel. Obviously, he's writing it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but in Luke chapter number 1, we get a very good picture of exactly why this Gospel is written. Just follow along with me in Luke 1, verse number 1. We're going to read down through verse 4. It says this, and this is Luke obviously writing, and he says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. So a lot of people were witness to what Jesus was doing, what was taking place in those times. And he says, listen, a lot of people have done this. And he says, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. There were those who had been a part of Jesus' ministry throughout. Therefore, verse 3, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught." He says he's writing the book because he's carefully investigated all of the the claims, all of the accounts of what had been told about Jesus and his miracles and his parables and all of the things that had been said about him from those who had been with him from the beginning. He says, I've carefully investigated these things. There's an author and speaker, Josh McDowell who his testimony is pretty remarkable, uh, such that as someone who wanted to disprove Christianity, he sought to investigate all of the claims, even going overseas and looking at the libraries and looking at the historical records. And Luke is saying, listen, I have investigated all of these things, and so I thought it wise for me to write an orderly account of what took place, and I want to do this so that there can be a solidification, if you will, uh, uh, and a certainty about what has taken place and the things that have been taught. And so as we study our passage today, just keep those couple of things in mind. He has investigated the claims, and now he's writing an orderly account to help us with our faith. Our faith should be strengthened by studying the Word of God, by seeing an orderly account of the life of Jesus, by looking at what He's famous for. If we just want to take and build off of the song that we just finished singing, Luke is saying, I'm going to write these things out in an orderly manner. I've done the investigative work for you. In other words, he's the one in the, in the group at school that uh, is an overachiever. You know, you have some that they just will kind of tag along and they'll reap the benefits. Luke's saying, I've done the work for you. I've put an orderly account. Go ahead and read it and be assured of what Jesus has done and who he is. And so as we get to Luke chapter number 10, and you can go ahead and flip back over there with me, just a few pages away, I'm sure. As we get back over there, let's keep those couple of things in mind as to why he wrote it. Verse number 1 of chapter number 10. And your title probably says, you know, that Jesus is sending out the 72. And, and in verse number 1 it says, after this, and obviously after what has taken place and what he has written in chapter number 9, again, an orderly account. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Now, before you think, Pastor Dave, we already preached this passage, did you forget that? You've heard that phrase before. Jesus has used it elsewhere in his teaching and in his ministry. And so, this is not a duplicate passage, although it has the same terminology right here. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore 
to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. Just four verses for our study this morning. When I originally looked at preaching this passage, I thought maybe I could preach the entirety going down to verse 24, but uh, there's just too much in here uh, to, to just kind of skip over some of these things. It's a pretty simple passage. I mean, I don't think this is one of them where as you read it, you say, oh man, I got to really bust out the commentary on this one. I got to really dig in. Now, we like to dig into God's Word, but this is a reasonably simple passage. Let's teach our way through it. You look back to chapter number 9 to set the context for this. And again, if you have your Bible, you can just page back and you can kind of see some of the titles that are there. And he's tying events together, Luke is, to give a big picture of what's taking place in the life and the ministry of Jesus. So to begin Luke chapter number 9, Jesus sends out the twelve. Then we have an account of Jesus feeding the 5,000. We have Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ. Remember whenever uh, the Lord asked, hey, who do people say that I am? Well, what about you? Who do you say? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We see the transfiguration where they get to see the glory of the Lord. We see a display of Jesus' power over the spiritual realm. His rejection by some. And then as we get to the end of chapter number 9, we see that there are three separate accounts of those who say, I will follow you, but then choose not to. They count the cost and they say, no, I'm not going to do that. Let's remind ourselves of those three real quick. Luke chapter number 9, we're going to read verse number 57 down through verse 62. Again, this is just as a refresher to build into chapter number 10. As they're walking along the road, verse 57, a man said to him, talking about saying this to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. We don't hear any more from him. Seems that he has counted the cost, and he has decided that it's not worth it. He says to another man, Jesus does, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And uh, as a reminder, his father most likely was not dead at the time. Let me live out the remainder of my days with my family. Let me get my inheritance. Let me make sure that I am set, and then I will follow you. But the And, and so... Jesus says, verse 60, let the dead bury their own dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. I want you to proclaim the kingdom of God. I want you to count the cost. I want you to, as Paul is going to do later on, say for to me to live as as Christ and to die is gain. For me to live, it's Christ and it's Christ living through. To die is gain. I've counted the cost. I've said that it is worth it to follow Jesus. Still another verse 61 said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. And you might get slightly discouraged saying, there are all these individuals who are saying, it's not worth it to me. It's not worth it to me. I've counted the cost and that's not something that I want to do. And I want to just take a moment to remind you that you can either see and focus on the positives and the positive example, or you can see and focus on the negatives and the negative examples. So let me give you a for instance. You have these three individuals who have decided that the cost is not worth it. Let me ask you a question. Anyone know someone who was a follower of Jesus and then just walked away. Anybody know of someone who maybe they attended church with you for years? Uh, Only about 50% of you. Now that surprises me. So either the other 50% of you are sleeping or you haven't formed very many relationships within your churches that you've attended or somehow or another you got surrounded by people who uh, 
Every one of them was faithful. I could give example after example after example after example after example of those who were following Christ and then just, boom, decided it's not worth it. And they walk away. I could give you examples of those who were in the ministry and no longer attend church, have basically disavowed their faith. There have been some high-profile Christian leaders and Christian authors, Christian musicians even, who have disavowed their faith. And you can look at those and you can say, wow, that is so discouraging. I, I can't, I, I sometimes look at my own life and I wonder, like, is, is that going to be me? And, and you can focus on the negative examples of those who have counted the cost. And, and it's not like Jesus hides this from us. He tells us that there are going to be those who are going to count the cost. And they're going to say it's not worth it. Now let me just be a real honest person with you. Their accounting methods are really bad. That's the truth. Like Their accounting methods are really bad. Hopefully if you have an accountant who does your finances, uh, takes care of your taxes, hopefully that person has a good accounting system. Hopefully things balance out at the end. Those who count the cost and say it's not worth it to follow Jesus, they likely have a very short-term view. They lack what we talk about here at North Winds frequently, and that is what? An eternal perspective. If you have an eternal perspective and you count the cost, you're going to understand that the weight of glory far outlasts and outweighs the temporary challenges and difficulties and even persecution that one might face as being a follower of Jesus Christ. But these three, they counted the cost and they walked away. I don't think it's an accident that after recounting how three walked away, and listen, there are examples of larger numbers walking away, so many so that at one point Jesus says, turns to his 12 disciples and he says, are you going to leave also? Do you remember what their response was? To whom shall we go? You're the one that has the words of life, like you're Jesus. Um, I got nowhere to go at this point. That's some good accounting. But in this instance, three walk away, and then what's the very next verse? After this, the Lord appointed 72 others, and sent them two by two ahead of him. Three, verses 72. Now I know if uh, in the margin of your Bible, it probably says something about early manuscripts. Some of them have 70 and some of them have 72. Uh, this is obviously not a major matter of theological importance, but it is nice to have an understanding of, okay, which number is it? Obviously, there was a copying error, a slight one, that would have caused the differentiation between 70 and 72. If you look later in the passage, it says 70. So I tend to lean towards thinking the first one would have said 70 as well. And there was probably just a copying error that was made early on with that. But whether it's 70 or 72, you have them, 70, let's say, nice even number, sent out. Because although three said the cost isn't worth it, there were still a large number who said that it is. My youth pastor that I grew up under is still faithfully serving the Lord. Makes me happy. Actually, I guess I had two youth pastors, and both of them are still serving the Lord. I can look back and I can see Sunday school teachers still serving the Lord. Those who, my, my pastor uh, at the church that I went to with Kim... Uh, we got to see him multiple times last year. Uh, his grandson was on the same golf team as Kylie. And so it was so neat. Uh, we went there and uh, we grew up with his daughter, Heidi. And, um, and so we got to see her and then uh, Pastor Yoder and his, and his wife, Cindy, came to some golf matches. And it was just neat to see faithful servants of the Lord 
if I'm not mistaken, just celebrated 50 years of marriage uh, this past month as well. You can look and you can find numerous accounts of those who have been faithful to the Lord. Don't allow yourself to, to be discouraged by those few who might walk away. Don't be discouraged by that. Again, I don't think it's an accident that he recounts three that said the cost isn't worth it. And then 70 that he sends out and he says, all right, let's go. Now notice how he sends out those 70. It says that he sent them out two by two ahead of him. Now, why do you think he might have sent them out in pairs rather than individually? I think there might be two reasons and maybe even more why Jesus would do this. Turn back in your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes. A pretty familiar passage here, Ecclesiastes chapter number 4. Verse number 9, we read this. It says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. You ever worked by yourself and then worked with someone and at the end of the day after working with someone, you're like, oh my goodness, I'm so thankful for your help. Yeah, it was such a relief to have you there helping me. I worked all day yesterday by myself and do you know how much I accomplished I'm almost ashamed to say this. I told, my, I told Kim and Kylie at the end of the day, I said, I would have done better to have stayed in bed all day. I got negative work done. And what I mean by negative work is that that means that I broke something in the process of trying to fix something. And then in the process of trying to fix that thing, I was unsuccessful again by the end of the day. Well, at the beginning of the day, I had a functional vehicle. By the end of the day, I didn't. Okay? That's the way my day went yesterday. I could have used my father-in-law, who's a mechanic, and uh, would have probably had me taken care of within about 30 minutes. In fact, I called him on the phone. He's like, if you were here, like, we'd get this done in no time. I'm like, I'm sure we would. Two are better than one. They have a good return for their work. It goes on to say in verse number 10, If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. And a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. I don't think it's an accident that the Lord sends them out in pairs because two are better than one. I have said many times uh, how thankful I am for, uh, I and Kim are for Pastor Kirk and Donna and their willingness to partner with us here at Northwinds. Uh, Pastor Kirk is someone who has been in my life since a very young age. When I was talking about those who have been faithful to the Lord that I can look back on, I can see Pastor Kirk and Donna uh, through the years and their faithfulness to the Lord. Uh, the special nature of our relationship, it does my heart good to be around Pastor Kirk. It just does. Uh, I don't know if you have anyone in your life who is like that, but just having them near you is an encouragement that is hard to explain. If you don't have someone like that, I really encourage you to, to form a relationship that uh, is meaningful and lasting and that uh, carries you through. And so two are better than one. They can encourage each other through the work. When one falls down, the other one can help them up. Uh, you know, when it, you ever watch the show, I think it's on the History Channel, it's called Alone. Anybody ever watched Alone? All right, well, the concept of Alone is pretty simple. <laughs> they take people out and they drop them off by themselves. Out in the middle of nowhere, not like, they, 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 they get ten, ten, like ten items they can choose. They can take like a tarp. They can take an axe, 
They can take a bow. Uh, they can take some fishing line. But they go out there and they just drop them off by themselves. If you've watched that show, you'll know that there is a recurring theme on that show. The struggle of being alone. It's tough. Physically, some of them can handle catching fish, uh, shooting a uh, musk ox, uh, and, and providing for the food. It's amazing how they set snares and they are able to uh, catch their food. And But then there's this relational and social aspect that they're missing. Why? Because they're alone. We're designed to be with others. When Jesus sends out these 70, he doesn't send them out and say, you know what, you have me and I'm enough and so you don't need anybody else. No, he sends them out two by two. Even in the midst of knowing we have the Lord to lean on, the one who will never leave us, never forsake us, we still need relationships. We still need relationships. There's a reason why I was going crazy towards the beginning of this pandemic. I had a hard time not being with people. Now, if you would have talked to me about 20 years ago, I would have told you I would prefer to not be around people. Anyone ever made a statement like that? Like, if I could just go live out in the middle of nowhere, yeah. Uh, I used to have that, <laughs> I used to have that perspective. <laughs> and I see it, there's a lot of finger pointing and a lot of hand raising and a lot of, I get it. We're designed, if you're ever alone, like truly alone for an extended period of time, you're going to see how very difficult that is. Jesus sends them out two by two. So I think they needed the encouragement of one another. Do you think that they, well, later on in the passage, Jesus tells them what to do when they face rejection. Is it easy to face rejection alone? Is it easy to face it with someone else? Is it easier to face when you have someone else that's still encouraging you along the way? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think they needed it for the encouragement, but they also needed it for another reason. Go back just a few weeks to how Jesus was confronted about him supplying his own testimony. Your testimony isn't valid, Jesus, because you're giving a testimony and you're only one person. It was a well-known principle, it was a well-known understanding that it took two people to establish testimony as valid. You could go back to Ecclesiastes 19 and you could find this. You needed two people to establish something as valid, and, and, and if you're really thinking right now, you're saying, now wait a second, Jesus is sending these 70 ahead of him. Sounds almost like what happened with John the Baptist. But John the Baptist was by himself, so why would John the Baptist's testimony be valid and these disciples need a witness? Process that for just a moment and then I'm going to give you the answer. Why is it, I like for you to think too, I, I don't want to do all the thinking for you. Why, why is it that John the Baptist, he was out there ministering by himself no question, it was, he was called of God, he was sent by God. Why was that okay? But now we need two to establish something as legitimate. Testimony is valid. Well, think about what John the Baptist was doing. Was John the Baptist giving testimony of what Jesus had done? Or was he giving testimony to what Jesus would do? He was giving testimony to what Jesus would do. He was saying, there's one coming after me. And I'm not even worthy to bend down and, and unlatch his sandals. He's the Messiah. He's the, he's the Son of God. I'm pointing forward. I'm telling you, this is going to happen. And then what would the people have the opportunity to do? They would have the opportunity to see happen what John said was going to happen. 
But now Jesus is sending out these 70 and he's saying, I want you to go into the towns and the villages that I'm about to go to. And what were they going to do? They weren't going to say what Jesus would do. They were going to say what they had already seen Jesus do. And so they needed to be able to establish their testimony as valid. You just walk in uh, to a town and you say, Jesus is coming. And here's everything I've seen him do. Yeah, okay. I think I've shared this with you before, but uh, I would take... Our, Kim and I would take our youth group in Pennsylvania. We would try to hit a different amusement park every year. So we went to Six Flags, two different Six Flags. We went to Kennywood. We went to Dorney Park. We went to, there were just a lot of parks within about a three-hour radius of where we were. Well, this one park that we went to, it had a roller coaster that sometimes whenever it would go up, it would get stuck. And it's been my dream to be on a roller coaster that gets stuck. I know that's a weird dream, but like I, I, like I just long to be on a roller coaster that gets stuck. That's, that's one of my life goals, okay? Um, if you can figure out a way to make that happen. So this one, it would like get going, and if it didn't make it, then they had to like stop it, and then they would bring it back down. So some of my students came back to me and said, we were on the coaster when it got stuck. And I'm like, whatever. You're just saying that. You're just saying that because you know I want that ha to happen to me. But then you know what? It wasn't just one that told me that. Then another told me that. And I mean, I was, and after, I'm like, by golly, I think it actually happened. I think it actually happened. There's a story that happened to me whenever I grew up on a farm. I think most of you know that. Uh, so the way we did farm work was from the time that I was just wee little, my dad would take me and sometimes my brother, we take us out to the fields. He might be mowing, and so we would just kind of do our own little thing. We were out behind my grandma's house one time, and this is going to sound a terrible story. Not terrible, but it shows my lack of intelligence as a young person. Uh, so we're out there, and my dad's on the tractor, and he's doing, I don't know what, like this, it had a hill, and then like there's a flat part up here. So he was up here. I was kind of down here. There was a big tree and I was playing around the tree and I look over and I got scared. And I start running towards my dad. And I hit a groundhog hole and I lost my shoe. And I kept running towards my dad, running towards my dad until I finally got there and he's like, what's the matter? I'm like, there were these big dogs and they were at the gate, like right where you would pull in, and they were going to come and get me. And so he looks down, and sure enough, there are some deer standing down by <laughs> the gate. And I've told some people that, like, we never found my shoe. Never found my shoe. We looked in all the groundhog holes we could find in the general area that I was running. And I've told that story to some of like, yeah, I kind of doubt that ever happened. I'm the only one who was there to have this and, and recount this story. Now, you guys believe me because you know that everything that I say is going to be accurate, right? That wasn't the time for laughter. That was the time for <laughs> amen, Pastor. <laughs> Don't you love it, though, whenever pastors say, now, this is a true story. Makes you wonder what they've been telling you the rest of the time, doesn't it? <laughs> but in order to establish something as valid as having some validity you needed two witnesses, and so as Jesus sends out these 70, he sends them out in pairs for encouragement and reliable testimony. John the Baptist, again, pointing forward, didn't need that testimony, but these ones who were saying, hey, listen, he's going to come, and here's what he's done. Don't we have a similar message that we're sharing? Aren't we going out and we're saying, here's what Jesus has done. Yes, we can look at the future, we can read Revelation, we can look at prophecy, and we can say, here's what is going to happen. But to a large degree, our message is one of, here's what Jesus has done. Here's what he's done. We can show it in God's word. Here's what he's done in my life. So he sends them out as his witnesses. And he says this, the harvest is plentiful. Now, Jesus used this in Matthew chapter number 9 when he sent out the 12, his 12 disciples, when you look out and you see that 
The harvest is plentiful. I wonder what you look out and see. When you look out and you see our country, what do you see? When you look out and you see the wickedness in the world, what do you see? When you look out and you see someone with political views that are different than yours, what do you see? When you look out and you see someone with philosophical differences from you, what do you see? When you look out and you see the, the decay of morality, what do you see? Jesus here says the harvest is plentiful. The laborers, they are few. What he is saying is, listen, there are a lot of people out there who are lost. There are a lot of people out there who need to hear this message. I'm going to send out 35 pairs, but I would love to send out 70 pairs. I'm going to send out 70 pairs, but I'd love to send out 140 pairs. I would love to have one missionary supported, but I'd love to have two and then four, and then eight, and then so forth and so on. The harvest is plentiful, but what do you see? When you see someone with political, philosophical, moral differences from you, does it anger you, or does it drive you to compassion? I want you to think about Jesus whenever he feeds the 5,000. You remember what it says about him. He looked at them and he had compassion on them. When the woman caught in adultery is brought to him, what do you find? You find compassion. The woman at the well, what do you find? You find compassion. You find over and over and over again that Jesus is moved with compassion. You know the only real time you see his anger? It's directed at the religious leaders. It's directed at the religious leaders. Why? Because they had this mindset that they were here. That they had arrived. That they didn't really need a Messiah. Yes, they were looking for a Messiah but they didn't really feel that they needed a Messiah in the way they truly needed. What did they want? They wanted a Messiah that would deliver them politically. They wanted a Messiah that would give them freedom. But Jesus came to deliver them spiritually and give them freedom like no other freedom. Are you moved with compassion for your fellow man? If you get nothing out of this morning's message other than just seriously meditating and pondering on that question, do you find yourself moved with compassion for your fellow man? I'm not sure that there's a week that goes by that my heart doesn't just ache and yearn and long to see more and more people submit to God, to follow his ways, to, to let him lead in their lives, more and more turn their lives over to him. I think about our teenagers often, and I pray for our teenagers often. And my heart yearns to have them really understand the need to follow Jesus the need to see him as the most important thing in their lives. I see parents struggling to raise families. And I, my heart yearns for them to understand that the greatest thing they could ever do for their family is to point them to Jesus again and again and again and again. My heart yearns for individuals who are struggling with loneliness struggling with fear, struggling with doubt, struggling with depression. For them to understand, for all of us to understand what is truly found in Christ. Is your heart moved with compassion for your fellow man? 
That's what motivates evangelism. That's what motivates true relationships, relationships that point others to Christ. The harvest is plentiful. The workers, they are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. Last week, we encouraged you to be praying for the Christian testimony in Afghanistan. We know that they are going to be and are facing challenges with being able to share their faith, live out their faith, be able to meet together. We know those challenges exist, and not just there, but throughout the world. Are you praying for our missionaries? I was so excited to see the, the brothers are now on the field, and uh, they had to go through a time of quarantine. And you say, how do you know? You can go on to our church app. You can go to our mission section. You can find the updates for each one of our missionaries to be able to pray for them, to pray for the Vances as they are ministering there. We, we need to be praying that even more missionaries are raised up. I know I already mentioned the students, but I got to be honest with you, students, I pray for you all the time that you'll be bold with your witness in your schools, that you'll be willing to share your faith with those at your lunch table, those on your sports team, that you'll be willing to pray before your matches and before your games, that you'll be willing to acknowledge Jesus as the Lord and point others to him. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out workers into his harvest field. And then he says this to those 70, go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Now you remember those three from the end of chapter number nine? They counted the cost and they said no. Jesus does not paint a pretty picture. He does not paint the rosy picture that a lot of times Christian speakers, Christian authors, sometimes even pastors, he doesn't paint the rosy picture that many times those speakers do. He says it's going to be it's going to be hard sometimes. What did he say? Back whenever the one in verse 57 of chapter 9 said, I'll follow you wherever you go. Well, I just want you to know, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests. I got nothing. I got nowhere to lay my head. I'm not looking for luxury. I'm not looking for that, and I don't expect you to either. So if things get hard, just know that I want, I, I understand that. I'm living that. But be faithful to me anyway. He says, okay, I'm not going to do that. When the next one says, listen, I want to go bury my father. In other words, I want to be able to get my inheritance. We think about the, and we've talked about the prodigal son before, right? Who asked for his inheritance early. This one wants to wait and make sure that he has enough to take care of himself. Be able to sustain himself just in case going out and serving the Lord isn't all that it's cracked up to be. In case it's difficult, in case people reject him. Counted the cost and said no. Now Jesus here he says, listen, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. I'm not sure why, as a Christian community, we've gotten to the point where we are surprised when people don't like the message of Christianity. Don't like the teachings of Christianity. It's not a new thing. It's been taking place since the beginning when Jesus sends out these 72 or 70 it's been taking place since he sent out the 12. It's been taking place since the 12, to a large degree, were martyred. Ten of them, at least, were martyred for their faith. It's been taking place. The message of Christianity is offensive. It is. It says, listen, you are under the wrath of God. It says you can't accomplish this on your own. What's the message of society? Anything you believe you can do, you can do it. Just, you know, it'll be all good. If you, the message is you need help. You need Jesus. That's offensive to some people. Don't tell me what I need. Don't tell me I need help. I can do this on my own. I can be good enough. I'll develop my own religious system. Jesus says, listen, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. It's going to be hard out there. You face an attack for your Christianity? Praise God. Praise God. Do you remember the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount? Go back to Matthew chapter number 5. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. The beginning message of Jesus. 
said, just understand, it's not always going to be easy. You're not always going to be loved. You're not always going to be liked. You're not always going to have somebody saying, I am so glad you told me that. Oh my goodness, wouldn't you come back? Now, sometimes that does happen. And we rejoice over those victories. We rejoice over the baptism that took place last week. What a wonderful time together that was. But we also understand that there are times of opposition, both personally and corporately. Attacks on our faith. You want to teach the truth of the gospel. You want to teach the entire message of the Bible. Some people are not going to like that. A large number of people are not going to like that. Simple things that you would think everyone would agree on from the Bible. Life begins at conception is offensive to a large part of our, of our country. But it is biblical. It's biblical. So what do you do? Do you say, well, since that might be offensive to some people, we just don't teach that then? No. You teach the entirety of the Word of God. You let the Word of God speak for itself. And if you face attacks... Just know, Jesus says, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Lambs among wolves are in danger. So don't be surprised. It's okay. You have someone who's upset with you about your Christian faith. Now, you don't need to be, like, mean about your Christian faith either. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I enjoy having good, robust conversations with folks i'll be honest i think that it's unwise to use social media in most of these uh, dialogues it doesn't accomplish anything but in the context of relationships a lot is accomplished i'm sending you out like lambs among wolves it says this do not take a purse uh, a purse this we're going to wrap up with verse four don't take a purse or a bag or sandals and don't greet anyone on the road now this screams of urgency doesn't it this screams of urgency when it says don't greet anyone along the road, it's not encouraging rudeness. It screams of the urgency of the message. Almost like a message that we learned very early in history, right? Paul Revere. The British are coming. The British are coming. I'll just take my time with this message. The British are coming. No, it was an urgent message, wasn't it? The British are coming, and on he goes, and he rides. When, we're, when Jesus is sending these 70 out, he's saying, listen, I need you to go to these towns. I need you to get there. And whenever you get there, I've got a purpose. I have a meaningful mission for you. I want you to go, and I want you to tell them what I've done. What does Jesus know? Jesus knows his time on earth is limited. His time on earth is limited. His opportunity to share with people is going to be limited as well. So he wants to make the most of every time that he goes into a town. So he sends these messengers out and he says, get them prepared. Don't get distracted along the way. Again, he's not encouraging rudeness. He's saying, listen, I need you to get there and I need you to share this message. What about you? What about you? I asked you earlier whether or not your heart is ever moved to compassion for your fellow man. Is there also an urgency within your heart to share the gospel with those who haven't heard or haven't yet accepted the Lord? Is there an urgency within you for your family, for your friends, for your coworkers? Those are the two thoughts I want to leave you with this morning. The challenge of, is your heart moved with compassion? As you look out and you see that the harvest is plentiful. There are a lot of people to share the gospel with. There are a lot of people who are going to fall under the judgment of God. And then the second is this, is there any urgency to your message? If we don't share, who will? 
I want to challenge you. See the urgency of this message. See, see the compassion Jesus has for those who are lost. And let's join him in his work. Maybe you're the answer to the prayer for more laborers. Maybe you're the answer to the prayer for your coworker that a grandma, a grandpa, a mom, a dad has been praying for. You do realize that there are people all around this country and all around the world praying for their kids, praying for their grandkids, praying that the Lord would break through to them, that the Lord would soften their hearts to the gospel. Do you realize that someone may be praying for you to be that person who shares lovingly, compassionately, but boldly with them? Father, thank you for your word. Drive us as your people to a greater urgency with this message, this message that there is salvation in none other. There is hope found in no other, only in the name of Jesus. God, I pray for those who are a part of, of North Winds Church. I pray for those who are a part of Mohican Church of the Brethren. For those who are part of Congress Community, those who are part of Emmanuel Old Stone, and other churches in the area, and extending beyond our area, that a, a, a large number of people would have compassion and urgency towards their fellow man. That every one of us would be the answer to a prayer that is prayed by a mom or by a dad, by a brother or a sister, a grandma or a grandpa, an aunt or an uncle. May we be your hands and feet, sharing a message with compassion and urgency. Pray this in Jesus' name. So I've talked a lot this morning about sharing the